Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Mohiddin Mirza, your host for the program Food for Thought. I'm glad you are enjoying this program. We recently got uh, several emails uh, on the different topics we have been uh, providing to our audience. This time, on this program, we are very delighted that uh, we are going to talk on a world-renowned expert on the subject of obesity. A little bit of introduction of uh, Dr. Arya Sharma, and later on we'll introduce you to him as well, is a world recognized as one of the leading obesity experts. He has authored or co-authored more than 250 articles on the management of obesity and related cardiovascular disorders. He has lectured uh, extensively all over the world. Just before we started the program, I was talking to him that he was in the Middle East and has traveled extensively in that area. He was recently appointed Professor of Medicine and Chair of Obesity Research and Management at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. He is also the Scientific Director of the Canadian Obesity Network. He further uses his expertise as a leading obesity expert as the Medical Director of Edmonton Capital Health Region Interdisciplinary Weight Wise Program. As a leading expert in obesity, Dr. Sharma passionately believes in the educating the public on the, this chronic disease. He writes a blog as well, and I have gone to that blog and will give you his address later on. And even if you type the word Dr. Arya Sharma, it will take you to that blog as well. Dr. Sharma, welcome. Thank you very much for making time available. I know you're a very busy person. When I try to contact you, and within a few minutes I got the email, I was just so happy. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about you that uh, on your pursuit of this uh, subject of obesity, you were in Germany before uh, working there and then came to Edmonton. What year was that? Well, I came to Edmonton in 2008. Uh, I came to Canada in 2002, right, and prior right. to that I was working in Berlin, right, right. Uh, where I did most of my medical training. And my initial training was as a, uh, in internal medicine and nephrology. Right, right. Uh, and I practiced as a nephrologist before coming to Canada. Right. But my research work, but also my clinical interest, took right, me more right. and more towards dealing with obesity and related problems. Right. So let's start with the, what is obesity? Even I think I have some knowledge of a few things in there, but when I start looking at obesity and overweight, so how, what's a good definition for our audience? What is obese person or what is obesity? Yeah. Obesity, the way that I look at it, is having excess weight that right. affects your health. Right. Uh, so just having a few pounds of extra fat in your body does right. not make you obese. But when that extra weight starts affecting your health because it is starting to increase your risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, liver disease, sleep apnea, and this long list of problems that you can get. Just with the extra fat? Just with fat. the extra fat. When you start having those problems, right. then we can speak of obesity. And now we know that there are some people who, when they gain five pounds, right. start having problems. Right. And there are other people who can gain 20 pounds and not have problems. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it is very difficult to give an exact cutoff to say, right, right, you know, yeah. if you're here, you have right, obesity. Right. If you're here, you don't, right. because it is a gradual increase. Right. The World Health Organization definition of obesity uses uh, the body mass index, which right, is right. Uh, a number you can calculate based right. on your height and weight. Right. And when your body mass index is over 30, yeah. uh, we normally say that you are clinically obese. Now, the number 30, however, applies to Caucasians. When you talk about people so from... BMI, the body mass index, mass, yes. is, is a number. It's, well, it's a number. It's actually a quotient. It's, it's the ratio between your uh, uh, weight, weight. weight in relationship to your height. Is it simple to calculate? I mean, I could easily calculate it? Or? Uh, it's easier to do if you have a calculator. What you take <laughs> is your, height, your, your, right. your, your weight in kilograms and right. divide it by your height in meters. Okay and divide that number again by height in meters oh, I because see. it okay. is height in meters squared. Square. Okay. Okay. And that gives you a number, okay. and that number is your BMI. Okay, I see. And, and number of 30 is considered? Uh, 30 for Caucasians right. is considered the cutoff. Right. When you talk about South Asians, so right. people coming from you know, the Indian Peninsula or uh, um, um, those East parts Asian, of the world, right, yeah. um, yeah. even East Asia, you're talking about uh, obesity is uh, starts at about 25. Oh, I see. Okay. Right, because right. there is more susceptibility for some of these problems. Right, right. Mm -hmm. on, on your blog, when I was browsing through, I saw 
that your definition is what you described. But overweight is generally fat plus muscles plus everything. Total weight is that. Yeah, it? see, and that is the pr that is one of the problems with just getting on a scale because then you just get on the scale, you're right. measuring everything. Exactly. Right? You measure bone, you measure right. muscle, you right. measure fat, you measure the fluid that's in your body, right. all those everything things. Everything right? together, yeah. Um, so, but it is an ap approximation. Most right. people, right. when their BMI is over 30, right. unless they're some kind of an um, you know, extreme athlete right. and right. have a lot of big muscles, right. Right. Uh, are actually fat. Right. I right. mean, that's the bottom line. And if right. you did more sophisticated analysis of body composition, you would find that most people with a BMI of 30 have more body fat than someone who has a BMI right. of 25. I is, there, is there a level of normal fat, we call it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if when you look at the normal range in men, you would say that the normal range for men is about 20% body fat. Okay. For women, it's about 30% body fat. Okay, right? And in fact, we know that if you reduce your body fat to below that, right, right. you will also have problems. Really? Uh, mm. and, and, and you see that happening, for example, in people who are extreme athletes right, or yeah, people who yeah. are anorexic or right. dieting extremely, you will right. find that there are health problems right, that right. you can get if you do not have enough body fat. Right, right. And is it this body fat is deposited in certain areas? Uh, yeah, but well, you know, you, you have to think of body fat as energy stores. Okay. Right. So okay. fat is the source of energy. It it can be the source of energy. It's actually a storage organ for energy. That's the but function of body fat. Does it come before sugar is used by the body, or? Uh, it's not before the sugar comes. So so think of it this way: that if you're, if you eat more calories than right. your body uses, right, then you have to put those extra calories somewhere. So they are stored. And so they get converted into fat, and that fat gets stored in your fat tissue, right. most of which is underneath your skin. And so we call this subcutaneous fat. So when you pinch right, right. underneath your skin, right. that is subcutaneous fat, or that is skin fat. Uh, and that is actually the best place to store extra calories, because otherwise, what do you do with them? Exactly. You know, they will just float around, yeah. and they will yeah. cause problems. Yeah. And so, right, yeah. um, so, so that's where the extra fat goes. Now, unfortunately, in some people, the extra calories do not just go into the skin fat, right. but they go into the belly fat. Okay. <laughs> and you start storing that right, fat in right. other organs, right, which yeah. includes inside the stomach, right. uh, inside your liver, in your pancreas, in your muscle cells, and that's when the fat starts causing problems. Okay. All right. Right? All right. So, the, and this varies between male and female, or men and women. Yeah, men, men are much more likely to deposit extra calories uh, in their stomach, in their liver, etc. Uh, and so you speak of the male pattern obesity or, right, or exactly. the apple form, yeah. right, central obesity, right. versus women tend to put m most of the fat around the, uh, around the hips, right. around the thighs. That's where most of the fat goes. Right, right. Uh, but you find crossover. You find men who, you know, have a lot of subcutaneous fat, right, and you right. can find women who have large bellies right. and put the fat inside yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, and there is a clear relationship between the amount of fat that you're carrying inside your abdomen right, okay. and your risk for heart disease. Okay. And you mentioned that calories to fat. So uh, how, as a, just to give an idea to our audience, how many calories extra will make one pound of fat? Yeah, so one pound of fat is approximately 3,500 calories. 3,500 calories. And if you're saying, so if for a week you eat more 500 calories more a day right. than your body actually needs, right. by the end of that week, if you store right. 500 calories right. every day, right. by the right. end of that week, you will have gained one pound. So that's... Uh, what you're saying is seven times 500 is 3,500 straight forward calories. Exactly, calories. That's, the, that's the calculation. And these calories could be from any source? Ultimately, they could be from any source because in the end, it's calories. So all the calories get converted into into calories in the end. So whether you're eating meat or you're eating uh, you know, fruits and vegetables right, right. or you're drinking oil, right. in the end, it's the calories. Right. Right? And the calories all mm. ultimately get, get used as fuel. Because I always thought that it, it probably is the fat which get deposited, so that's not the case. It's the total calories. See, the body is very, is very smart at changing one thing that you right. eat into something right. else. So, you, right. so you know, if you're not eating enough carbohydrates, yeah. your body will actually take the protein that you're eating and change it into carbohydrates. Okay, okay. Right? And I so see. there are a lot of systems that your body has to convert one nutrient into another. Right, right. Uh, because in the end, what you need is you need, you know, you need to burn fatty acids and glucose. Those are right, the things right. that you can yeah. burn. And this fat you're talking about is not saturated or unsaturated. This is It's irrespective of that. Irrespective. You, know, you know, there are some other qualities of different types of fats that can affect your immune system right. or your risk for yeah. inflammation, etc. Yeah. But in the end, it's still calories. I'm glad you clarified it that I always had in mind that if you eat very rich, fatty food, 
then is the calories are more serious but is the total calories and then it's the total you think of it as your think of calories as the currency of body weight right, right right and managing your weight is like managing your bank account right right you have to know how much money is coming in what is the bank doing with your yeah. money and how much money are you spending Very interesting that's, and right. that's that's how you manage your finances but is there an easy way to calculate calories uh, i know on ready made dinners you could see the calories yeah. but yeah see we 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 don't have a natural instinct to judge calories okay right you cannot look we are very bad at looking at food and guessing what the calories <laughs> is but there's no way to do that okay. right uh so unless you read the label right or you look it up right. th there are many internet sites in fact you can get applications for your ipod which you can download which really? if you enter the food right. uh, or actually the newest application you take a picture of the food and right. it tells you how many calories in the food really so <laughs> So unless you do that, yeah. you will not know how many calories you're actually eating. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, most of us tend to pretty much eat the same things every day. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so if we don't have to learn all the calories of all yeah. foods. That's right. We just learn the calories of the foods that we like to eat. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can pretty much calculate. And it's not about you know, being so accurate, but you're getting right. a rough idea so that right. if you know that you need 2,000 calories, right. Right. well, really, then you, know, you shouldn't be spending that on eating you know, things that have 3,000 calories. Exactly. That's right. So I'd like to talk a little bit on the subject that once you eat your food and there are fats as well, the something starts right uh, in your mouth, saliva and enzyme, but there's no fat enzyme here. They, they have the stomach, is it? Well, what, what happens in the mouth? Just quickly, uh, some digestive process. <laughs> Well, the food that you eat, uh, right. you know, first has to be broken down. Right. And so that's part of the chewing process. Right. And as you do the chewing process, you, it actually mixes with an enzyme called amylase, which is in, right. your, which is right. in your saliva, right. which actually right. starts the fat digestion. Uh, amylase yeah. uh, will act as a carbohydrate, so it does something with the fat as well? Uh, well, actually, actually, uh, actually, the digestion starts in this you know you know uh, uh, with the carbohydrate right, digestion right. okay uh, which is why <laughs> if you you know if you take a piece of bread and you chew it for long enough right. it yeah, actually starts sweet, yeah, it's, it turns into sweet yeah, right so right. so yeah. the the carbohydrate digestion actually starts right, there right. Uh, and then it goes into the stomach and then there's more digestion and then it goes into the gut where you have lipase which right. then starts digesting your uh, your fats okay, again so breaking it down and this lipase come from the from the pancreas pancreas yeah yeah. So where does the bile from? And the then the bile, <coughs> the bile actually allows the lipase, which breaks it into fat, right. to become soluble, so that things can, uh, you know, things can be absorbed and things can be digested. And and in different parts of the gut, different things happen, and there's right. a number of enzymes right. that play right. a role here. Right. Right. Um, so it is a complex process, but right. yeah. the the gut is actually very efficient in extracting f nutrients from your food. From okay, yeah, right, yeah. because it's designed for doing that. It's pretty long too. Uh, and well, and the reason it's so long is because uh, <coughs> y with the traditional foods, right. you know, if you're a hunter and gatherer, right, right. and you're eating roots and berries and yeah. uh, you know raw foods, etc., right, well, then you right. need a long gut to actually fully digest those yes, foods. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, if you're eating fast food, which is highly refined, well, right. then you ne only need a few centimeters and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> very, very fascinating on this uh, subject here. So, <coughs> going to now. Of course, we touched a little bit already on the, the major causes of obesity, and you did mention about food, and we talked a little bit. So food is such a diverse subject from simply because of the demographic things, and a lot of people have, and you have traveled all over the world. So tell us a little bit about your experience regarding food. For example, you are in uh, Middle Eastern countries. Wh what did you find there? Did you find their food was balanced or... Uh, you found a lot of people who are obese as well or overweight as well? So well, one of the things when you talk about food is differentiating between traditional foods that people eat. Right. Um, and the parties. <laughs> and the food that is now right. pretty much everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go to du Dubai, you yeah. can get Kentucky Fried Chicken, you can get McDonald's, you can get all of the fast foods that right, you want. Right, right, yeah. Um, which are not traditionally food, uh, which yeah. are not the traditional food. Now, also in the traditional foods, one has to distinguish between the traditional foods that the normal person would eat every day, right. which are usually different from the special traditional foods yeah. that you would eat on special occasions. And they could be locally grown. And they're locally <laughs> grown and they're locally produced, and right. it's usually quite a bit of right. work actually yeah. producing those, foo uh, yeah. you know, cooking yeah. those foods. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
So, you know, if you take the example of Indian food, right. uh, when you go to a normal Indian restaurant here yeah, yeah. and you see the foods that are being eaten, yeah. those are actually not the foods that sure. the, you know, the poor fellow working, um, you know, working on the, on the farms right. in India <laughs> actually <laughs> eats every day. Right. You know, he's not busy eating tandoori <coughs> chickens and... Uh, uh, and, butter yeah, and butter chicken every day. <laughs> now what he's eating is dal roti, yeah, you know, which is just you know some small little lentils right, right. and a little bit of curd and a little <laughs> right, bit of yeah, onions, and yeah. then he has a roti, yeah. uh, which he has made himself on. Uh, you know, that those are very simple foods. Right, That's what right. you eat every day. Right. Yeah. And on special occasions, yeah. you know, when there's a you know there's a wedding, there's a celebration, there's a festivity. Right, right. Well, then you make the special foods. Right. Yeah. The problem is <coughs> that now when we think of traditional foods, we're t only thinking of those special foods. <laughs> That's true. Right. That's true. When you say let us go for an East Indian dinner, yeah, true, yeah. well, what you end up eating is the kind of food that you would normally be eating no, for yeah. a celebration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, because those foods have become so common, even right. when you go to India, they're eating those foods every day. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And that's where the problem starts. So most of the traditional foods, you have to differentiate between the, the everyday traditional right, foods, right, right, right. which are usually actually quite yeah. simple, right, yeah. and the special, special food. traditional foods, which and you only get in festivities. And the and way our... Uh, Civilization has changed. We eat more outside, and the restaurant food and fast oh, absolutely. food, uh, they all come into picture, and then you don't count the calories. Well, nobody counts <laughs> calories, right? And, and, and that's the problem. There's no <coughs> calorie awareness. If I ask somebody, how many calories do you think you need? Yeah. yeah. People have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And but is there any rough guideline? I mean, for Well, there's a, a rough guideline. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the rough, rough guideline here is that you are burning about one kilocalorie per minute. 1,000 calories. One calorie, one calorie. Or, or one thousand calories, one. which is one kilocalorie, uh, per minute. Per minute. Okay. So if we sit here talking to each other for right. twenty minutes, right. each of us will have burned twenty calories. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So if you do that over twenty-four hours, right. that is one thousand uh, four hundred and forty minutes. So it's, say roughly. 50 just not doing anything. Doing nothing. Right? If you, if you just sit there <laughs> or you just do nothing, on average you will burn about fifteen hundred calories a day. Right. Now you can add to that the calories through activity, right. uh, which for most of us, unfortunately, are not a lot of calories because right. we don't do a lot of activity. Exactly. So you right. can add 200, 300, 400 calories. And of course, there are some differences in, you know, in your age right. Uh, right. or you know, even whether you're male or female. Right. There are some differences. But that is a rough example. Right. So yeah. most yeah. of us are probably between 1,800 to 1,000 calories is what you say is rough estimate. And this is without any exercise or running or Without e excessive exercise. Excess now, of course, you know, if you're an athlete or if you're doing very hard labor, you right. can burn 1,000 calories right, right, uh, right. in addition to that. Right. But for most of us who are quite sedentary, you know, if you say, you know, between 1,800 and 2,000 right. calories right. is probably right. where most yeah. of us. Yeah. So when you right. went to some of the Middle East country, you have traveled extensively. Of course, there's a difference in the food and the type of food and the variety of foods which they eat. What did you find, uh, again, very high calories? Um, I w very good point you raised that normally we are not designed to count the calories. No. But what we are designed for is, uh, as a hunter and gatherers, I like that term because I love it to use. <laughs> that's our instinct. So that's Well, the instinct <laughs> is to eat food when there's there. Yeah. Right? Because uh, you know, when you go back as a hunter and gatherer, you know, one day you get food, next day you don't. So you, when the, when you have the food, you better eat it. Right. Yeah. Right. And if you are not eating alone, but in a family or in a group of people, then you better eat fast, because you don't know whether the food is going to finish. Right. Really? So, so that's also. So, so that's also there, right? So food. when you're hungry, right. Not only do we tend to eat fast, right. But interestingly, when we are hungry, we also make poor choices. See, so when you come home in the yeah, evening and you're yeah. starving, yeah, right, yeah. and you open the refrigerator, yeah. you're not going to take the bag of, gr uh, of carrots. Yeah. No, you will go for the <laughs> leftover pizza, right? right? Because, uh, right? So, so eating when you're hungry means that you're going to make, the, make poor choices, yeah, yeah. which means you're going to eat the calorie-rich foods, right, right. and you will eat too fast. Yeah, yeah. And the problem with eating too fast is that our digestive system and the signals that the gut sends to the brain that tell you that you have eaten are actually very slow. Mm. So it normally takes between 20 to 40 minutes after you're starting the meal for your right. brain to realize that you've actually eaten. Really? Mm. And in those 20 minutes, you can do a lot of damage, right? So I don't realize. So it, it's, a, it's a signal which goes from the stomach? Yeah. So when you're hungry, so, so the signal <coughs> we talk about here is right. sort of the, the, the balance system or the homeostatic system. Right, right. When you haven't eaten, yeah. you get hungry. Yeah. 
you eat. But that's also hormones. Those involved are hormones in involved yeah. in that, yeah. right? Yeah. So right. there's a hunger hormone. <coughs> right. Makes you hungry. Right. You eat. Right. You feel full. Right. So you call that satiety. Right. And then you stop eating. Right. Right. So it's a hunger and satiety. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the system that regulates intake uh, on a homeostatic level. Now mm -hmm. things are a little bit more complicated than that because there is also another system right. that regulates food intake and that is nothing to do with hunger and satiety, that has to do with appetite and reward. And okay. that has to do with mm. liking of food. So mm. here's the story. So if right. you go to a restaurant and you have just ha eaten your three courses right. and you're actually quite full, in fact you're so full that you could not finish your plate. Right. And then the guy comes and says, who's for dessert? And then shows you the dessert. Right, yeah. And here's the <coughs> chocolate cake. And then you look at the chocolate cake and you say, well, you know what? Maybe I can, I can, I, I can try it. <laughs> okay? Right. Why are you saying yes? Right. Yeah, yeah. You're full. Yeah, exactly. So really you should not be saying yes. Exactly. Yeah. But the reason that you're saying yes is because it is not your homeostatic system, hunger, right. hunger and satiety system. That's separate. That's a separate system. That system is full. Done. Mm. But the reason <coughs> you're now saying yes is because there's another system in your brain which is the mm. reward system, right, which right. tells you that if I eat a piece of that chocolate cake, it's going to make me feel good. Really? And it's really? a reward-seeking behavior. Mm. And that's a different part of your brain that does that. Really? And <coughs> there is some interconnection, because yeah, when you're right, hungry, yeah, yeah. you're also more likely to look for the foods right. that make you feel good. And that is why when you're hungry, you will seek out the fat foods, the salty foods, the sweet foods, yeah. uh, the energy-dense foods. Because when you are talking of this... Uh, chocolate and ice creams, I, uh, you are talking about me. <laughs> well, I'm talking about everybody because that's, that's the normal behavior, right? Uh, those, are, those are foods that we eat for pleasure. But never analyze it from that viewpoint which you have given us the perspective that this actually is a, is a separate system in a different a, part of the brain. It's a different part of the brain. And interestingly, it's the same part of the brain that also does addictions. So really? So mm. smoking. Right. Recreational drugs. Mm. But even other behaviors that are addictive uh, are the same parts of the brain. And that's why you very often see that when people stop addictions, right, right. like they give up smoking, right, yeah, they do other yeah, things, yeah, they, they turn to food. Hmm. And they use the foods in the same manner that they were using whatever drug they were using before. Really and they start putting on weight. Hmm. So that is that addictive part of the brain that controls that eating behavior. Right, right. Well, we'll talk a little bit more later on that. So on the subject of food, uh, as I mentioned, you, s you see a whole variety in different uh, cultures and uh, you mentioned ordinary food which we eat versus the special, and special foods have become ordinary foods. So going to the, of course, uh, types of foods, um, we did talk about the fat component and also the vegetables and where is the balance when you eat the food? When human beings were hunters and gatherers, how did they learn that uh, this is the balance you need? Well, they went for hunting and only got protein, meat, for example. Yeah. Well, <coughs> well one day you eat certain things and the other day you eat other things. Right. right. And so right. there is a mix of the things that you eat. And, and, and uh, you know, the technical term for humans are omnivores. We can eat anything. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Right. We can survive in the Arctic and yeah. we can survive in the tropical forest. Right, right. Uh, because we can take whatever foods are there, right. uh, whether it is animal foods or plant foods, uh, and we can eat them, and our body has this ability right, to take yeah. the nutrients exactly, yeah. and Looks convert like them into yeah. whatever it is that the body needs. Right, right. So when you eat a mixed diet, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry too much about what you're eating. Okay. But one does have to make sure that you're eating what they call the three food groups. Right. right? right. Uh, that you always have, there's enough plants and vegetables, right. that there's enough meat, that there's right. enough dairy products. Right. Uh, because those are really the things that you're trying to mix. Because if you have a balanced diet, that means that your body is going to get all the nutrients you exactly, need. Exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, you run into some deficiencies. Yeah, yeah. Does the um, body has the ability to extract nutrient which it wants, uh, preferably? Let's say I need more iron, for example, or something. You know, I, actually, actually, that does happen for some nutrients, mm -hmm. that you will get an upregulation of right, systems right, that will right. be preferentially extract certain right, things. Right, right. Um, in most cases, however, most of the nutrients that we eat will, will actually get absorbed. Right, right, right. Well, so quite interesting. So we might come back a little bit later, but now I'd like to talk a little bit on, um, say, factors like age and gender. We did talk a little bit on that, genetics, environmental factor. So the age, with the age, as we go older, let's say from young child, of course, we go into adulthood and when you're a teenager, anything goes, you know, you, you never worry on these things. 
and then of course the, you know the sequence. So is there variation on uh, obesity in your in your research? You're finding obesity child children childhood obesity is there as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what, one of the biggest problems we have now is that the children are getting more and more obese. Mm. Um, when you mention age, I, uh, I think one of the reasons that most of us find it more difficult to maintain our weight right, with increased right. age is not because we eat more when we get older. It is because our metabolism tends to slow down. Oh, I see. Okay. And so when I was talking about 2,000 calories right, right, a day, right. that is really for a young guy. Right, yeah. Uh, the rule of thumb here is that as that per decade, yeah. your actual energy requirements may fall by 100 to 150 calories. So if you go from age 20 mm. to age 50, right. really at age 50 you should be eating yeah. about 400 or 300 yeah, calories right, less yeah. than you were eating when you were younger. Mm. Now, we don't <laughs> normally change that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the reason we put on weight is because mm. we continue eating the same amount of food as we were eating before, right. but our requirements has, has actually dropped. Yeah. And that's the point, you see, how to trigger that. Uh, hopefully, our program will help people to think about it, that uh, metabolic changes come. So you said every 10 years, decade? Yeah, but it's a gradual process, yeah, right? Gradual so process. if as a 50-year-old, you're still eating the same amount of food yeah. as a 17-year-old, as a I can guarantee <laughs> you that you're putting on weight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important factor then to realize that as, you, as we age, then uh, calories, we have to watch these calories. So the important thing is that you, are, you, you burn less then and you, you burn store less more? Because you, uh, yeah, you burn less, and so what do you do with the extra? You store it. Right, right, right. So age is one thing, and then gender. Well, women tend to need less calories than men. Uh, largely they need less? They need less calories than but men. But I saw more uh, sugar addiction in <laughs> <laughs> that, which is different, which has nothing to do with <laughs> calories. That's the different <laughs> part of the brain, <laughs> okay. right? The, the homeostatic part, which is about calories, right. how many you need. You, right. They tend to need less, right. largely because their muscle mass is smaller. Right. And it's the muscle is one of the tissues that burns quite a lot okay. of calories. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I know that uh, women play such an important role. Of course, mothers and wives in our homes, that when they cook it, they want to make it as tasty as possible. Of and if you are especially young, married, then food is the number one thing. Yeah, when you have guests in your house and they're not eating, then you get, <laughs> then you get quite... Uh, the the you social know, pressure on eating is... is, is huge, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a sign of... Uh, and, and that's part of the complexity. Most right. of our social activities, most of our social functions right, right. revolve around food. Right, right. So genetics has to play a role as well? Uh, genetics <laughs> plays a big role because genetics really uh, determines your ability Right. Uh, you can almost look at it as fuel efficiency. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right? So if you have the genes that make you very fuel efficient, right, well, then right. you need less calories. Yeah, and if yeah. you eat too many calories, you're going to yeah, store them. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, also the, comp also the, pro uh, the things that we have discussed around appetite regulation, right, hunger yeah. regulation, right. all the hormones, right. all the receptors, all the factors exactly, in yeah. your brain yeah. that yeah. determine yeah. this, yeah. all of those things are regulated by genetics. Exactly. Right? Yeah. There, and there are many genes involved. Right. And so... Of course, I can take anybody if they have the genetics for obesity and right. I put them in an environment where there is no food, yeah. they yeah. will starve. But you haven't discovered a gene yet which they turn on? No, there's not. There's, <laughs> uh, there's lots of <coughs> those genes, but each gene alone has a quite, a, quite a small effect. Really? Right? Really. Yeah. Uh, but you can assume that most of us are programmed, right. genetically programmed, to eat and that, yeah. that when food is there, we eat That's it yeah. and we try not to burn yeah. it. Yeah. all of the food so that we can store some for yeah. later. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. I'm sure we're going to continue the subject more. Uh, well, fascinating. It's always a learning process that uh, I hope you have picked a few things. The thing which I picked up is that after every decade of 10 years, your metabolism slows down, of course, from teenager to 50. And I think that rationality and that understanding how our digestive system and brain works Hopefully we could uh, control our obesity and live a healthy, longer life. We'll be back uh, with more program on this subject. Thank you very much. This is Food for Thought program. I'm Mohidin Mirza, your host. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.